The information provided in this program is of a general nature and is not intended to be personalized financial advice. We encourage you to seek appropriate advice from a qualified professional to suit your individual circumstances. Main Freight is making millions off supply chain chaos, but it's starting to fall away. We don't know where that flaw lies. Infratil launches an 850 mil capital raise to buy one NZ. I asked the CEO if he's keen to buy anything else. We really like these digital infrastructure assets, we call them. It's Monday the 12th of June and you're watching Markets with Madison. Main Freight made millions in the pandemic. Its annual revenue just hit $5.6 billion. It hopes to keep growing that pie, but freight volumes globally are already slipping away in a consumption slowdown. Main Freight has been breaking rules from the beginning. Back in the 70s, Howard, Bruce and Neil got together and worked out how to build a special freight. It was started in March 1978 by the still chairman, Bruce Plested. It was initially called Mainline Freighters and aimed to compete with the heavily regulated transport industry. 45 years on, the global logistics company has more than 10,000 staff and operates in 26 countries, moving goods by road, air and sea. Its revenue hit 1 billion in 2009. Last year, it topped 5 billion. Making bank off the pandemic supply chain congestion that saw freight demand and prices surge. Its share price hit almost $100 in 2021, but it's since come back to settle in the high 60s. In the most recent financial year, it made a net profit of $426.4 million. A portion of that is always shared with staff because it's big on culture. Quotes decorate the walls of its branches and the doors of its trucks. Every branch has a lunchroom where employees, executives included, eat a provided meal at a long table, family style. The weekly profit and loss statements are plastered on the wall for everyone to see. On a tour of its top performing Auckland branch, Managing Director Don Bray told me he doesn't get involved in the operations. In fact, his desk doesn't even look out over the freight yard. He doesn't want to distract his colleagues. Main Freight plans to invest $676 million out to the end of 2025, including on property in Europe and the US. That's despite the Americas being its poorest performing region right now. Inflation is starting to bite, and a global economic slowdown is taking its toll. Don, good to see you. Thanks so much for your time. No problem. Equity analysts are calling what's happening with main freight at the moment a normalisation. You've used words like moderation. How would you describe what's going on and where in the cycle main freight is at at the moment? Well, we've come off a crazy couple of years where supply chains were congested and volumes of freight were at levels that we've never seen before. So is that normalisation coming off the back of that? I, I don't know. Um, we're not sure. Um, we're just being cautious as we proceed through this next 12 months or so. Um, you know, there's less volume across the freight docks. There's less volume being moved internationally. In some respects, that's quite a good thing. It's helping our people get back on top of volume. It's helping us get our quality back in line of where it should be. I don't think we were good enough in the last two years. Conditions didn't allow us to offer the levels of service that we prefer to offer. Um, so it's an interesting time, to be perfectly honest with you. Recently, with your most recent full year result in regards to the New Zealand business, you called it sort of frustrating fortunes of the past couple of years. What do you mean by that? Well, that, I, that was referring to New Zealand, where not only were we seeing an economic slowdown and um, seeing discretionary spending start to reduce, but we also had weather events that knocked out roading infrastructure. We had Kiwi Rail ferries that weren't operating. So it was frustrating and we had had a lot of freight moving prior to that. So that was the frustrating fortune comment. In regards to the pandemic, just how much did not only freight demand, but also skyrocketing freight prices push up your margins compared to average? Oh, I don't think it was about the gross margins. I think it was about the revenue. In fact, our gross margins declined on the back of high freight rates. I mean, you're moving from, say, $1,900, $2,000 for a container, a 40-foot container to move from Shanghai to Los Angeles. 
up to the price of $21,000 over the space of six months or so. So our gross margins actually reduced. It was actually the volume that moved that assisted us because we were able to push more volume through the network, which helped our profitability. Well, on volumes, it's dropped about 8 to 7%, depending on if you look at air or sea. Where do you expect that to find a floor, and what's your working timeline for that? We don't know where that floor lies. If you look at Long Beach as an example, their volumes in the last couple of months have decreased over 20%. Um, if you look at that Trans-Pacific eastbound trade, which is the biggest trade, sea freight trade lane in the world, volumes are down more than 30%. Now, whether that normalises to another level, we're uncertain. And part of that is about, I think, a destocking and a lack of ordering by importers, by retailers, to try and get themselves back to some form of normality. I think what that provides, though, is some normality, if we can call it normality, back into the supply chain. But of course, on the other side of that is you've got um, some form of inflation and macroeconomic climate, which is softening, the build, building for homes and the likes is not there. So therefore, building products aren't moving as much. In our portfolio of customers, a bunch of really loyal customers um, who we really are fortunate to have, we have a lot of food, beverage, DIY product, which continues to move whether it's you know in a recessionary type period or not. So that's good for us. If you can have any foresight as to what this economic environment could or would, would look like, I know I'm asking you to bring out your, your crystal ball here, but if you could capture some of that revenue, how much of the, that you made in the past couple of years, how much of that are you wanting to keep and aiming to hold on to to ensure it doesn't drop off so markedly? As much as possible. I mean, we're a bigger and better business because of the supply chain congestion. We batted above our weight and we were able, because of our relationships with that we'd forged over a long period of time with shipping lines and airlines and with our, our own people, we were able to move more freight perhaps than some of our competitors. We invested in more infrastructure, we've got a more intensive network, therefore we're better positioned to actually grow this business again in the future. Are we really interested in the next six to 12 months? Of course we are. Um, do we really understand what it's gonna be like? No, we're a bit cautious about it. Are we really confident about the long-term future of this business? Of course. We think about this business for 100 years. We act as if we're going to be around for another 100 years. And, and therefore, we're excited about what's in front of us. Yeah, I'm interested, interested to know how you balance that cautiousness versus that longer-term investment. Your capex for this year, you're expecting to spend this financial year about $376 million around about. That was almost doubled in late last year, in November. At that same time, you said that you were expecting air and ocean prices to start moderating. So what was the balance you were trying to make there between cautiousness and long-term investment? And in hindsight, which is a lovely thing, do you think that was the right call? Yeah, it is the right call. We've got a very strong balance sheet. In fact, some analysts are calling it a lazy balance sheet. But we've been consistent with our dividends and we've been consistent with investing in that network. And the size of the business that we have today requires well, it's actually 676 million that we're going to invest in the next two years. And, you know, that's across New Zealand, Australia, Europe and uh, America. So there's lots going on. What we learned coming out of the recession was that if we didn't invest when we came out of the recession because we were overly cautious and we missed having the right amount of infrastructure in the network, this time we're learning from that, continuing to invest in the infrastructure. And I think also to remember that not only are we investing in that capex, but we're also investing in leased facilities as well to comp complement what our customers are asking us to do. If we're opening a warehouse, we're likely to get the transport business outside, out of the warehouse and hopefully the air and ocean business into the warehouse. So it helps the business grow. But if you had to pick between customers, staff, and shareholders, I know this is a hypothetical question, but if you had to please just one ultimately, who would it be? Well, we don't call them staff, they're people. 
um, and they're all complementary to each other. We couldn't do this job without our customers. They're first and foremost in everything that we do. We have a really great bunch of people working really hard, working their butts off to make sure they look after those customers. And of course, if we do that well enough, the shareholders are going to be looked after. Now, I want to bring up something from the history books, if that's all right. Having read this and finishing it just recently, a story that this begins with, your book, in 2011, it was a dinner in the Netherlands where you were, I'm sure you remember it well, uh, you were about to finalise the deal to buy the Wim Bosman Group. And a quote from you, him, the deal's off, we're going home. Correct. You've never really played by the rules, have you? What do you think it is about your leadership that's contributed to the success of Main Freight and how integral has it been? I don't think it's about my leadership. I think it's about the quality of the people that we've got in the business. And, and just by the way, I got a short, sharp lesson from the founder and chairman of the business after he'd heard that I'd made that comment that no egos would derail this deal. And uh, it was a great lesson from him. And uh, when you have mentors like that in the business, it makes the leadership role very, very easy. You intentionally said that within his earshot though, didn't you? <laughs> he wasn't there. He was on his beach in Waiheke and... Uh, Sorry, Bruce said this to you, didn't he? He did. I see. And uh, our erstwhile legal uh, friend and uh, um, long-term employee of Main Freight, Carl Howard Smith, reported back to Bruce that night that, uh, Bruce, uh, that I'd told the owner of this business to <laughs> and... Um, um, hence the guidance that came back was don't allow egos to derail the deal. And, um, and it didn't. But he deserved it. He was behaving like an arrogant uh, Dutchman and um, we needed to say something to get the thing across the line. And you said it. I did. I'm interested to know about yours and Bruce and in fact the rest of the board and executive uh, leadership team's relationship. Talk me through the strength of that and, and why do you think investors, you know, pour so much love really into your company? Do you think that that's a really integral part of it? I think the investors keep us on our toes. But I've, what I love around the table or we have around the table is a bunch of people that are actually there to give guidance to the leadership team and that are interested in the long-term journey of Main Freight. And I think we trust each other. We argue a lot. There's a lot of differing opinions. But Bruce's leadership around the board table is such that we don't move unless we've got full agreement around the table. It's a great um, example of how to lead around the board table. And I think if you think about what we're looking for in our people, and that's long-term careers rather than a job, then around the board table, we're looking for those people to have a long-term career with us as well. So we probably, again, bat outside the rule book and not looking to refresh the board too often. It takes a really long time for them to understand the business and we'd like them to be here with us for a long time. That way we get consistency in the messaging, consistency in the strategy, and we haven't got some sort of knitting club director wanting to tick all the governance boxes rather than giving guidance to the leadership team. The reason I brought up your leadership of this business personally is because I wonder about succession. And I know you're not going anywhere anytime soon. I'm not trying to start that rumour by any means. And I'm sure you have plenty more energy to continue to give this company. But do you worry about that? Do you think about it? Do you fear that you're creating some really big shoes to fill when you do eventually leave? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, we've got, don't, don't forget the structure of the business regionally is set up so that we've got a similar leadership team in each country. And each one of those leaders have the ability to run the business, plus probably another 10 or 20 of them who are in their teams, youngsters coming through the business with passion. And it's about a long-term career. They're all learning the business in every which way they can. They, they lead from the front in the business. So I've got no worries at all that if the bus takes me out tomorrow that someone will step up and do an even better job. Thanks so much for your time, Don. No problem. Thank you. 
The infrastructure investor Infratil is raising $850 million to buy the remaining stake in One New Zealand, formerly known as Vodafone. It got $750 million from institutional investors last week and will offer up the extra $100 million to retail investors this Tuesday. Infratil Chief Executive Jason Boys is here to sell it. Hey Jason, how are you? Good, thanks Madison. Good, hey thanks so much for joining us. Why just a $100 million slice of this capital raise for retail? Yeah, well, actually, it's a bit more. We um, we have the institutional placement this week, which was seven hundred and fifty million, and in that bucket, uh, the, the brokers who do look after a lot of retail investors, obviously, they bit into that as well. So, what we do is for people who would need more than that eighty thousand uh, dollar limit to keep their pro rata share. Uh, they will usually be looked after by a broker and we do a lot of work on our share register to make sure we know who their broker is. And then they will get their shares through their broker. And then for everyone else, um, there's the retail offer. And what we do is we analyze the register and we make sure the size of that offer is enough based on a bunch of assumptions uh, in terms of that 100 million, but also the $80,000 limit is enough so that if everybody um, who isn't going through their broker wants to stay pro rata, they're able to. So it should be enough um, uh, to allow everyone to do that. I don't want to make any assumptions from this, hence why I'm asking you this question. Mm. If you just look at the numbers, it looks like mm. you value institutional investors more than retail. Is that or is that not mm. the case? No, it's really just a reflection of the register, right? So what we, the way we set up these offers is to ensure it, pretty much everybody um, should be able to keep at least their pro rata share. So no one can uh, needs to get diluted if, if they're able to follow their money into the offer. So we just break down the register and this is the way you break it down to ensure, as I said before, everybody has a chance to maintain their pro rata. So that, that split you're looking at, if you take out the people who own big chunks of shares for whom $80,000 is not enough um, to stay pro rata and they'll come through their broker, it's just really just the maths of breaking down the register to make sure everyone can have a chance to do that. All right, so launches on Tuesday. Tangibly, tell me how it works if I'm keen. You will get, um, if you were a shareholder on Tuesday when we announced it, you'll get something um, through email or the post, however you've elected to do that on our share register, which will have a booklet, which will have all the instructions on how you can apply for shares in New Zealand up to that $80,000 limit in Australia because of their rules are slightly different. It's up to, I think, $45,000. And then you'll have a period of time, I think it's about two weeks to fill out the form or do whatever you do um, to apply for those shares. At the end of that, we take all the, um, all the applications we've received and try and make sure that everybody who wants to be pro rata can be allocated that within the 100 million. Now we reserve the right to um, increase the size of that retail offer above 100 million in case we need to make adjustments to ensure that we achieve that outcome that I'm talking about. You're raising this money to buy Brookfield stake in One New Zealand, formerly Vodafone. Why do you feel the need to buy them out? Well, it is really good, I think, um, as an investment, but also for the broader infrastructure portfolio. In fact, you know, we had been trying for a while before we partnered up with Brookfield to buy all of Vodafone. So it's an asset we've, we like. Um, we think there are good returns for a long period of time, which are the types of investments uh, Infratool likes to find and, and why we've managed to be so successful and grow so well over, you know, our 30 year history. So it definitely hits the spot. As it turned out, the best way to buy the asset initially was to work with Brookfield. Um, but probably from the first day we were in partnership, um, we expressed an interest in having the other half. Now works for them. You, you know, we got we sold the the mobile towers assets out of out of that business last year, um, so we've actually both got most of our money back that we put into it uh, four years ago. So it was sort of a natural time for them to be exiting, and our fundamental view on the business hasn't changed. In fact, it's probably improved. We know it more. Uh, we like the team and the. Um, and the investment has been really good. So it's a good time to do it, I think. Now that you're at, or almost its full owner, what's your plan for yeah. One New Zealand? Uh, all the good things they're doing at the moment, I think we can um, we can push them ahead on. So we're improving uh, the network, uh, particularly in the regions where it had been underinvested by the UK parent uh, for a long period of time. So that work will continue. Uh, the rebrand has been really good in getting uh, the name back in front of people and it's kind of new New Zealand focus configuration. 
And I think there's an opportunity to build on that into areas that, again, when it was under UK ownership by a largely mobile phone company, it never did, like selling people their call center software or selling them other ICT products from the people they love, like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. We're actually a really good partner for them to choose to help them buy those products and services. So that's a couple of areas where we see good growth in the future. What do you make of the new logo and the new name? Do you like it? I do like it. I actually came into Auckland Airport the other day and I didn't realize this, but they have, um, it's co-branded, right? With one New Zealand and still the Vodafone brand and I'm um, seeing them next to each other. It looked quite, quite a good pairing actually. So that's a nice evolution. I guess you have to say that now that you own them fully though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although, you know, I'm the last person you should ask about whether a logo looks good or a color's good. So I'm happy to leave it to the experts like Jason Barris. Fair enough. Hey, while I've got you, Jason, any plans for any more acquisitions locally or elsewhere? We're always looking and there were a few questions about that from our institutional investors as well. And we've been talking for a while that we really like these digital infrastructure assets, we call them, you know, things like telecommunications companies and things like that. So we are definitely continuing to look globally um, at businesses that fit that bill and that would be a nice um, addition to the portfolio. Yeah. So infrastructure never stops. Um, that's part of the part of the model. So you shouldn't expect that to start now. Look forward to hearing more about that eventually. Thanks so much for your time, Jason. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Medicine. If you've got any ideas on what you think Infratil should buy next, let me know. Or if you have any other ideas that you want covered on the show, just flick me an email. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.